What's up, Vertical Church? How we doing? Yeah, let's go. Well, if we hadn't had the opportunity to meet, my name is Tim and I'm on staff here at the Vertical Church and we are so excited that y'all are joining us today. Again, like Stephen said, if you're new here and it's your first time checking us out, please go ahead and scan that QR code in front of you on your, uh, on your sheet or uh, on your seat, not sheet. Scan that QR code or text the word welcome to 928-440-9500. For those of you that are watching online, welcome. We love you. We have people standing by to connect with you as well. And if you're new, just go ahead and type in the comments welcome so that we can engage with you and love on you a little bit. Well, today... We are starting our brand new series to kick off the summer called Back to the 90s. Who's excited about that? How many of you were actually alive in the 90s? Yeah, good crowd. That's what I'm talking about. So who in here still rocks out to a 90s playlist maybe? Anybody? All right, all right. Who in here maybe is is streaming on, on Netflix or Hulu a 90s TV show series? Nobody. All right, hey. For a little bit, my wife and I started watching like Seinfeld again or something just because we needed something to burn the time, I guess, which we're going to get into a little bit later today, right? How many of you are still rocking clothes from the 90s? Anybody? Yeah! Big cheer over there. That's what I'm talking about. No one's wearing some like nostalgic Jordans or something? No? Believe it or not, it might not look like it, but this shirt that I'm wearing comes all the way from the 90s. My brother wore this shirt in high school, and he graduated like 98, 99, and uh, then he went off to Marine Corps boot camp, and he left it in the closet, and I was like, I like that shirt. So I started wearing it, and I know that he really loved this shirt so much. So Norm, if you're watching, thank you. He was gracious enough to let me keep this shirt, and I'm so happy that it has stood against the test of time because this, this thing's about to turn 30 soon. Give it up for this shirt and the way that they actually used to make Make things, right? Speaking of time and things that stand the test of time, like I don't know if you guys scrolling through your social media ever came across these memes. I got some memes that I'm going to share with you, like picturing in my mind what like a 25-year-old truck or vehicle looks like, but what an actual 25-year-old vehicle looks like. Show them that first photo, Hudson. Right, like that's what I envision a 25-year-old truck to look like. But really, it's a whole lot newer than I think it is, right? Show them the next one with a car. Like, I envision that, or maybe like a G-style body cut list from the 80s. But no, like, that BMW is 25 years old. And I know that there are some of you in this audience that are old enough to be my parents or maybe your grandparents, and you're like, wow, cute kid, like, you think you're old. I know. I'm about to turn 38 next Friday, but I have a special meme just for you. And you, I know you guys are all like, oh, that's adorable. Yeah, and then you got that tank down there on the bottom that uh, when taken care of, that thing will stand the test of time too. They don't make them like they used to, right? But who here has had the thought of like, man, where does the time go? I know probably everybody here in this room, unless you're a teenager or below, has had the thought of, man, where does the time go? Well, I'm going to get a little edgy here and share some statistics with you and show you where a lot of our time is actually going. Brace yourself, this may hurt on the inside a little bit. So I did some statistic diving, and the first stat comes from this website called Statista. And the average American spends 142 minutes a day. That's 71 hours a month on social media. Keep in mind, these are just averages, right? So some of you may be a lot lower. Some of you may actually be a lot higher. And we'll pray for all of you. The average American spends 93 hours a month watching television offline. I know kids are like, what do you mean offline? That just means watching an actual television. All right, watching a television like through Comcast or your, your cable network provider, Spectrum out here, DirecTV, just watching a TV. 93 hours. I'm not talking about streaming Hulu or Netflix. The peak time for watching television online is guess when? During work hours. I'm about to retire from the military, so Jason, Danny, if you want to hook me up, I'll work here. Let me watch some Netflix. Well, no, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. All right. Now, this one's a little staggering because this, this statistic came from NBC News 
a decade ago. According to a report by NBC News, if you added up the minutes spent on social media in July of 2012, just July, in the United States, everybody on it, it would add up to 230,000 in 60 years. Imagine how much that has increased over the last decade. And finally, the average American spends about 10 hours per month watching Netflix or another streaming service. So there's no doubt that we spend a lot of time with a screen in front of our face. And there's no doubt that the generation in which we live in now is definitely like an instant gratification generation. I want it now. I got to have it now. I don't want to wait. Amazon, you better know what I want to order before I order it. And when I think about wanting it, it should be on my doorstep already, right? Like that is the amount of instant gratification that, that we live in. And if we have to wait long in the drive through we get upset. We get impatient for waiting for food in the microwave because when we're craving a Hot Pocket, 90 seconds just seems like an eternity, right? And the amount of time that we spend wasting in lines at the doctor's office or waiting for a table at a restaurant, it just seems unbearable. And for those of us that live in Yuma, how about the pharmacy lines when the snowbirds are in town? You could literally read the entire book of Psalms waiting in a pharmacy line and halfway through be like, you know what, God, I don't need these meds. Just take me now, right? Like it is that bad, that bad, all right? So it doesn't really make sense, does it? Because we just don't like to waste time, but we waste more time than we ever have. In fact, it's like an oxymoron. If having to wait more than 90 seconds for a cheeseburger and a large Coke in a drive-thru is something that upsets us, then, you know, we are wasting our time and spending our time just crazy in other places. What we learned a few minutes ago that the average American spends, if you add all of those up, each individual activity, the average American spends 174 hours per month on social media networks, on phone, on email, or just watching TV. Think about that. That's over seven days a month wasted on things that are seemingly not very important or relevant. So we act like we hate wasting time, yet we gladly give away a week of our month every single month. And with that in mind, I think it's safe to say that we could all benefit from learning some, some time management, right? And maybe some of you in here have thought like you've been wasting your time in other ways. Maybe you just, you're in a job that you can't stand. You hate your boss, you hate your employer, you just can't take it anymore and you just feel like you're wasting your time in a job. Or maybe for some of you, you're wasting time in a relationship that, that's going nowhere and it's divided and it just seems like you're not going anywhere. And perhaps some of you are just wasting time in general on things that don't even matter in front of a screen. I know we're all guilty of that, myself included. Well, this Back to the 90s series, we're going back to the 90s of Psalms. So we're going to be in the book of Psalms for this entire series, Back to the 90s. And through this... Today's obvious topic is time, so we're going to be talking about God's timing. And throughout this series, we're going to be talking about his protection, his justice, his kingship, and his holiness. And for this part, we're going to be, again, in Psalms, in the back part of the Bible called the Old Testament. That's where you find Psalms. We say the back part of the Bible if you're new to church because the Bible is divided into two sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. But if you really took a Bible and stuck your fingers in halfway and opened it, you're, you're bound to hit the Psalms roughly. If not, depending on how you shift to the right or left, you might end up in Proverbs or Isaiah or something like that. But it's like halfway through the Bible. And what the book of Psalms is, is a compilation of prayers and songs that were lifted up to God by the Israelite people. And the Psalms always have the one true God at the center of 
the message. And today we're starting with Psalm 90. So if you brought your Bibles with you, you can just go ahead and open up your books to Psalm, your Bibles to Psalm 90. We're going to be going through a large chunk of that chapter today. If not, all these scriptures will be in your program or on the screen for you. But before we get into the scripture, I kind of want to provide you some context to this message. And to Psalm 90, where we're starting. Psalm 90 is situated in a very significant location in the Psalms. It is the first Psalm in Book 4 of the Psalms. Now, you're like, why did you say Book 4? Well, the Book of Psalms is actually divided into five books or divisions. Book 1 is Psalms 1 through 41. And Book 2 consists of Psalm 42 through Psalm 72. and book uh, 3 is Psalm 73 through 89. Book 4 is Psalm 90 through 106, and book 5 is book 107 through 150. Now, Taking a look back at the previous book, book three, because book 90, or uh, Psalm 90 starts book four, Psalm 73 through 89 is basically a compilation of complaints. The Israelites are suffering. They're going through this long period of suffering and they are just bestowing all of their complaints on God. Similar to the way we do when we suffer, right? We ask God for help. Now Psalm 90 begins book 4 of Psalms that seems to start to answer the complaints with the assurance that God is Lord and he reigns. And will continue to reign. And the central subject of Psalm 90 is time. Time. Can't get enough of it. Don't get enough of it. Time is money. All the sayings. Time is important. But the central subject of Psalm 90 is time. It deals with the brevity of human life. We really don't have a whole lot of time here on this earth. But most importantly... The psalm examines how to live in light of the certainty of death. So for the rest of the time we have here, I want to hone in and focus on this question. How can I live in such a way that in the end of my life, in the end of my days, I can be certain and confidently say my life was worthwhile? So how can you say that in the end of your days that you can confidently say that your life was worthwhile? That's what I want to hone in on today. And first, in order to do that, we need to fix our focus. We have to first focus on the eternality of God. So if you're taking notes, there's a note sheet in your program. That's your first point to write down in that space. We have to focus on the eternality of God. God is eternal. And it speaks to that right away in the first two verses of Psalm 90. Let's read it together, shall we? It says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. The first verse gives us this confidence that God is and always will be our source of protection and care. And you see these two words here, dwelling place, that are used. This is closely related to another word that is used several times throughout the Psalms. And that word is refuge. God is our refuge. It appears frequently. The claim about God here is very, very personal to each and every one of us. God is our dwelling place. He is our shelter and he will keep us safe. The concern for time is also apparent from the first verse because it says the Lord has been our dwelling place when? In all generations, all generations, ever since he created the entire universe, The Lord has been our dwelling place. This speaks to how we see time, how you and I see time. We see time in the span of a lifespan, in a generation, my generation, my kids' generation, my parents' generation, my grandparents' generation, and so on. We see time 
In the span of that which we live, a lifespan, that's how we see time. But verse 2, verse 2, however, it speaks to God's eternal greatness by pointing to God's time. Before there was a world ever put in order, God was God. And from everlasting to everlasting, he will always be the one true God for all eternity. Can I get an amen? He is it. So if you want to ensure you live a life worthwhile, you have to fix your focus and live your life focused on God. The next thing that we have to understand is that tomorrow isn't promised. Not for either of us, any of us. Tomorrow isn't promised. Check out what it says in Psalm 90, verse 3, and then we'll read 5 and 6. It says, You turn mortals back into dust and say, Return, you sons of mankind. And then in verse 5 and 6 of Psalm 90, he says, In the morning they are like grass that sprouts anew. In the morning it flourishes and sprouts anew. Toward the evening it wilts and withers away. And then if you continue on and fast forward to verses 9 and 10, It says, for all our days have dwindled away in your fury. We have finished our years like a sigh. Do you know what a sigh is? (sighs) That's it. We have finished our years like a sigh. As for the days of our life, they contain 70 years, maybe. Or if due to strength, strength 80 years, maybe. Yet their pride is only trouble. And tragedy, for it quickly passes and we disappear. So one of the most important messages of Psalm 90 is that life is short, church. Life is short and death is near and tomorrow is not promised. This psalm goes to great lengths to express that truth. We are, our lives are like grass that fades and withers in Psalm 90 verse 6. Our years come to an end like a sigh in Psalm 90 verse 9. Our time quickly passes and we disappear in Psalm 90 10. Man, emotional damage. Like some of yeah, I got some laughs there. Some of you know what I'm referencing. But like that message can come off a bit depressing, can it? Like it may seem depressing that our limitations are a sign of God's wrath. This also may seem to be a message that is completely opposite of the message of hope that we get in the New Testament that in Christ, death has lost its sting. However, Psalm 90 is entirely consistent with the message of resurrection. What it really says is that life and eternity belong to God, not us. They belong to God, not you and not me. We don't control that. Therefore, our lives and our eventual resurrection come from God, our creator and giver of life. Psalm 90's focus on death reminds us that we live simply because God makes it so. So, since God has still made it so, and you and I and those of you watching online are here today listening to this, how could we live a life that is totally worthwhile? Well, first, by recognizing that each day is a gift from God. That's the next thing. By recognizing that each day is a gift from God. You see, if the main theme of Psalm 90 is that God is eternal and we are not, then the wisdom of this psalm is knowing how we need to react to that reality. And the psalm's main advice comes in verse 12. Read it with me on the screen. It says, so teach us to number our days. This is a request made to God. God, teach us to number our days. Why? That we may present to you a heart of wisdom. So what does it mean to number your days? Let's think about that. 
This line certainly does not mean for us to focus on how few days we have left. No, it doesn't do that. Having that type of focus, focusing on that negativity, will absolutely rob you of the joy that God has for you in this life that he has blessed us with. No, the wisdom of numbering our days comes from recognizing that each day is a gift. If you are here and you woke up out of your bed this morning and God put breath inside your lungs, praise him. It is a gift and a blessing. So we may not know the exact number of days that we have left to live, but we do know that we don't live forever here on this earth. So keeping that in mind that we have a small number of days that make up each of our lives, how do you feel you are spending your time? Marinate on that seriously for a second. How do you feel that you are spending your days? Are you a planner who, who takes care of all the important things and the busyness of the day and, and then you, you put off all the fun stuff? Or are, are you the opposite? Are you a procrastinator who, who pushes everything of importance aside and you live a fun life and you'll knock out the important stuff very last minute? Or do you even think about how you're actually spending your time and just letting whatever happens, happens? Most importantly, where does God fit into all of that? You see, Paul wrote this letter to the church in Ephesus in the back part of the Bible called the New Testament in Ephesians. In Ephesians 5, verses 15 through 17 says, Be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. So, looking back on your school days, or is there anybody still in school, maybe still doing continuing education in college? All right, there's a couple of you, but think back to your school days, right? And you had a test that you didn't study for, you forgot to study for this test. You could relate this to your work, maybe a project. You knew it was happening. You knew when it was. You knew that you needed to study for it, and you just didn't. You let it slip by. Maybe you did it because life got in the way and the busyness uh, just kind of got in the way of your studying, or maybe because your priorities weren't exactly uh, prioritized and lined up how they should be. Either way, when this happens, there is a similar prayer that a lot of us have prayed. And I know because in the youth during small group, this is still a prayer request that is high up on the prayer request chain. Oh God, midterms are coming up. Oh God, finals are coming up. Please help me pass this test. Who's prayed that prayer in here before? Yeah, a lot of us can relate to that prayer. You knew what the test was about. The one where you knew what to study, but you just didn't, even though you had the time and you had the resources to do so. Did you ever think that God already gave you the wisdom and the ability to pass that test? And time just wasn't used wisely? You see, wisdom would have been using the time God gave you and the brain God blessed you with to study. This verse says to be careful, to live as wise. So how does that relate to time management? Well, more than you might think. Look at it this way. Your next point. Write this down. How you spend your hours adds up to how you spend your days. And you can continue this by saying how you spend your days is how you spend your years. And if how you spend your days is how you spend your years, then how you're spending your days adds up to how you're spending your life. So if you're spending your days wasting time and avoiding what you need to do, that is essentially how you're spending your life. And that, my friends, is not a wise decision. This verse also urges us to make most of every opportunity that God bestows upon us. Do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do you know the best way to understand what the Lord's will is for your life? Spend time with him. 
pray, communicate, get into this holy book, this separate book, this holy Bible. That's what it means. Get into his word. Start spending time with God every single day and he will make known to you what his will is for your life, what your purpose is in this life and the direction in which he wants you to go. James 4, 14 says, why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? It's a deep question, ain't it? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Ouch. That one stings a bit, doesn't it, ladies and gentlemen? Your whole life, this, this life that we're so concerned about on this earth, the one filled with good and bad and happy and sad and peaks and valleys in this roller coaster that we're all on, it is but a mist that appears for a little while and vanishes. A mist and gone. That's our life. In the grand scheme of things, your life is just a blip. It is just a vapor and it vanishes. So why not make the absolute most of it? There's this idea that to enjoy life and to be happy, a fleeting emotion that we just have to live with this free spirit and be spontaneous with sails up, taking us wherever the wind takes us. And some people do... um, choose to live that way, but the bottom line is this. If you want to make the most of this life God has blessed you with, you can only do that by learning to manage every second that he has given you. And whether or not you decide to take charge of your time, your time is going to pass you by whether you like it or not. Monday through Friday, you are going to get up and go to work. Some of you work on the weekends And some of you that are still in school pursuing education, you're still going to have deadlines. You're still going to have projects due. You're still going to have the 9 to 5 or the 410 or whatever schedule you work. And then you're going to have to come home and you're going to have to cook dinner. And you're going to have to take the kids here and take the kids there and clean the house. They're years. The years are going to fly by you regardless of if you manage your time. But if you want to make the most of them and you want to live the way that God says, the way the Bible says you should, then managing your time is wise and it is a must. So how do you do that? How do you do that? Well, there's three simple ways that I want to give you that are super practical that you could take home with you. And that first one is prioritize, or excuse me, is making God your number one priority. That's number one, is making God your number one priority. In the busyness of life, everything that is going on, work, kids, school, activities, getting the house clean, doing chores, whatever it is, in the busyness of it, it could be hard or sometimes seem impossible to make sure that God is number one and that you're spending time with him. But if you put God at the center of all of that, you see, God isn't just some dude, that you put on a list of your priorities. God should encompass everything that is on your list of priorities to do. He should be the focal point in the center of everything. So make him number one in everything, no matter how busy you get, no matter how much you have to do, no matter what, spending time with God needs to be your number one priority. If that means you got to wake up a little earlier to crack open a Bible and pray, then so be it. If that means you have to sacrifice something extra, then so be it. This is a choice you will not regret making, and I can promise you that. Number two, prioritize the things in your life. So regardless of how you feel, some of us are really good at establishing priorities and seeing them through. Some of us are really terrible at it. But regardless of how you feel, we all have certain priorities in life. But if everything is so busy and everything is a priority, nothing is. You gotta list them out. If everything is important, if everything is a priority, then nothing is. And since God is now your number one, you figure out what comes second, what comes third, what comes fourth. My wife Kelly had to do this a couple months ago. 
She was overwhelmed with the busyness of life. Um, I, I work a lot of hours, so there's a lot of extra burdens that are on her. She owns a business. She volunteers in the youth. She uh, takes the kids to school, from school. There are activities, volleyball, dance, softball, all these things. And she was taking extra clients on days that she had scheduled off, but figured she could help and, and put them on the day off that she had planned. And she was getting really overrun and really overwhelmed. And when she sat down at the kitchen table and wrote out her priorities and who was coming number one, two, three, four, five, this not only helped her refocus, but it absolutely brought her peace as well. This is especially important if you find yourself to be a yes person. Anybody else willing to admit that? I am totally a yes person. I, I just don't want to let people down. I always think I can, think I can. I got it. I'll do this. I'll do this. And then, ah, it's, it's a mess, right? If you can relate, you can relate. But this is especially important if you find yourself to be a yes person. One of the best ways to remember your priorities is getting a planner. It's writing it down. It's using a calendar. We all are on these things so much of our day, there's actually calendars and planners that you could get right on here. So if your face is going to be in front of it anyway, you might as well put it to your own good, right? So write it down. And a lot of us can say, oh, well, I wake up and read my Bible every morning for five minutes. 10 minutes, 30 minutes, but then you miss. And then something else happens. Oh, I just want to sleep in. I don't feel like it. Oh, I got to be up early because work wants me in at early. And then it ends up becoming a habit to miss. Write it down and stick to this schedule. If you don't write it down, more than likely than not, it won't happen. There's studies. This is science. Write it down and there's a higher chance that it'll absolutely happen. And the same goes for your other priorities. Like I got to spend or spend time making my wife a priority. And it seems like I hate it about myself, in a sense. Like, I have to schedule time to spend with my wife, to spend with my kids. But if I don't do it, I'll get caught up and busy. And I'll just go and go and go. So even schedule time throughout all of your priority list. If it's with your spouse, if it's with your kids, make time. Make time with God, with, with all of those important things. Because if you don't, it's going to fly right by you. Number three. Hold yourself accountable. Self-accountability. To be able to stare at yourself in a mirror and self-evaluate is crucial. After you know what your schedule should be, pray over it. Ask God to help you achieve all that you need to achieve in the time that you need to achieve everything in. Ask him to help manage your time better. And then find someone else who will hold you accountable. I am in a men's group here at this church, which is a small group, and we're launching a Connect to Summer for small groups. And I know the men that are in my men's group will hold me accountable as much as I will hold them accountable. And if you're not in a small group, I encourage you to join one. If you serve at this church, maybe it's the leader of the volunteer community that you, that you are a part of. Take your first step. Serve. Get plugged into this community and let other believers help hold you accountable to your priorities, how you need to schedule your time, especially making God your number one. Find somebody. Or maybe you could find somebody that is also trying to manage their time better. And it doesn't necessarily have to be what I talked about, but it could be a brother, a sister, a spouse, a friend, a coworker who is trying to get better at managing their time. But do this. It is super important. Another way to hold yourself accountable is to write these verses down. We got these program sheets and every single one of these programs for you to write down. Take it with you. Hang it up on a bathroom mirror. Plug them into your phone. Because Reading Bible verses about your life being a vapor and disappearing while you're scrolling through TikTok and Instagram, that makes it sting a whole lot more. All right? That makes it sting a whole lot more. You are more likely to see that verse and just put the phone down and do something more with your life than just scrolling on a screen, right? So put these verses somewhere that you can see them. It could seem like there are things that you have to do and there are things that you want to do. More importantly, there are things that God is calling you to do. Opportunities that God is giving you. And if you're wasting your time, you just might not see it. And it seemed like a lot of this could, could pile up super fast. But if you're prepared and you have the right mindset, 
The mindset that knows God has blessed you with this life and you want to make the most of this breath in the lungs that he's given you, you want to make the most of it, then the rest of this year and the rest of your life is going to be much, much better. And God is the best one to help you with this along the way. Ask him to help you. Communicate with him. Pray with him. He loves you more than anything. And he wants you to see those opportunities that he's given you. And he wants you to grab hold of them. And he wants you to succeed in this life that he has blessed you with. So instead of focusing on the negative, instead of asking, why is my life so short? Instead, ask the question, what can I do with the life that I have left? Starting right now, what can I do with the life that I have left? And for somebody in here today, for some of you in here today, the first thing that you need to do moving forward in this life that God has blessed you with is stepping over that line of faith. And answering the most important question that you will answer in this lifetime. And that is, what did I do with Jesus Christ? Start following Jesus with it today. Because tomorrow isn't promised to anybody. And I feel that more this week now than I did in weeks past. For those of you that watch the news or follow the news channels on social media and that have known me for a while, you know that I have been serving this country for the last 20 years in the United States Marine Corps. And, and praise God for all those that served. We just lost five Marines this past week in a V-22 crash south of Glamis. A 33-year-old, a 31-year-old, two 21-year-olds, and a 19-year-old kid, not even old enough to have a drink yet, but he's old enough to die for his country. Last May in 2021, we buried a Marine of ours in my division, Corporal Orozco, we called him Ting Tang, died in a motorcycle accident. This sat heavy on me this last week as I was preparing this message with the brevity of life. And that tomorrow isn't promised because I work in a, prof in a profession where people are buried too young all the time. And some of you also work in professions in the medical field, firemen, police officers, state troopers, border patrol, where life is seemingly come to an end too short. And maybe it's not even a job. Some of you with maybe a terminal disease or, or know someone with a terminal disease some of you where the, the clock is ticking and, and you have a time limit that's been given to you. Know that God is in charge of that. Not the disease. Some of you have buried your children. God, never want to do that. Some of you know that I have three daughters. I should actually have four. Luna should be the fourth. In December of 2012, my wife and I had a miscarriage. And we lost one that, that never came to be, that never got to breathe the air on this earth. A lot of you know, a lot of you relate. Time is fleeting. Tomorrow is not promised. Don't wait to come to Jesus. Don't wait another second. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait till next week. Don't wait till next year. Start today. Start today. God loves you. And he wants to see you succeed in this life that he has blessed you with. So if that's you today here in this moment and you're tired of waiting and you want to live a life that is worthwhile under God's purpose, plan, and will for your life, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. I call it the ABCs to salvation. Believe, admit, believe, and commit. You admit that you're a sinner. You believe God sent his one and only son to die for the sins of all of us and that he raised him from the dead to conquer it all. And then you commit your life to him. So if that's you today, with every head bowed and every eye closed, no distractions, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. God, please forgive me of my sin. 
Heavenly Father, I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die for my sins. And God, I believe that you raised him from the dead to conquer it all, to conquer death, so that we could be made alive in you, to spend eternity with our Father in heaven. Lord, please fill me with your Holy Spirit. I commit the rest of my life to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If that was you, praise God. If that was you online, please go ahead and type the word follow in the comments. We have people standing by for you. If you're seated here today, you have this connection card that Stephen asked you to fill out in your program. On the back, you can check that box, I pray to become a Christ follower. Or you can use the QR code on the back of your chair, scan that, go to that first time follower and do that. You can text the word follow to 928-440-9500 and let us know that way. We want to partner alongside of you in your new path with Christ. And if you said yes to Jesus today or in the past and you haven't been baptized yet, that is your first step in obedience to God. Get baptized. Check that box to sign up for baptism and go into the water and out of the water. And like Jason said, we're not going to tell you when it is. Because don't wait. Sign up right now. Tomorrow is not promised. Tomorrow is in providence. And then take your first step here at the Vertical Church. See our first step table. Go out, get plugged in, and start serving the kingdom of God in a real way. And if you need prayer today, if this message has hit you and you need extra prayer, you do have a disease, or you know someone that doesn't have a lot of time left. I want you to see our vertical room. You see my man Larry right there holding that sign, or is that Rick? One of those two, but go across that hall and go into our prayer room. We have prayer partners standing by, all right? Now, today is another special day, because it's Communion Sunday. And communion is for the believer. So if you've believed in Jesus for your salvation uh, and you did not receive one of these cups, I want you to put your hand in the air so that you could take communion with us. And as the ushers pass that out, I'm going to cover this scripture. It's, I'm going to read it straight out of the Bible. It's not going to be on your screen. And if you need a Bible, we have Bible bars all over the lobby. Pick one of these up and take it with you. There's a salvation lesson inside and it tells you more about what you just did. But I'm going to be reading out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 28. And this is what it says. For I have received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Don't take it yet. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now I want you to pay attention to these next two verses. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Ladies and gentlemen, communion reminds us of the forgiveness that we get to experience through Jesus Christ but it's not just willy-nilly. It's not just take it because you're here. You have had to give your life to Jesus and meant it. We have to examine ourselves before we just eat the bread and drink the cup. And by participating with a humble heart and not just pretending to be right with God. So, let's remember Jesus today. Peel that first plastic foil back, this bread. And everyone take the bread and remember Jesus. And after the bread, remember 
by drinking of the cup. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, could you stand? We're going to worship, and I'm going to pray over you before I get off the stage. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for this opportunity to serve your kingdom. Lord, be with every single person in here today. Help us live lives that are worthwhile. Help us live lives that are dedicated to you, dear Heavenly Father. And it is in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Hey guys, Mikey here. Have you ever wondered how you can give here at the Vertical Church? Well, today I'm going to show you how. It's simple. No matter if you text, give through the app, or visit our website, it will all take you to the same giving destination. Let me walk you through it. One way you can give is online by visiting vertical.church/give. It's simple. To give now, click the Give Now button and fill out the payment information. We recommend making an account by filling out the basic info and setting up recurring giving. Another simple way to give is by texting the word GIVE to 928-251-4441. Click the link and follow the simple instructions. Or if you have the vertical.church app, you can simply open the app, click connect, and click GIVE. It's that simple. On a Sunday, you can place your offering in the envelope provided and then place it in the offering bucket as it is passed by you at the end of the service. You can use the postage paid envelopes provided on Sundays. All you have to do is drop it in the mail. Or you can send a gift to our address. Thank you for your generosity as we continue to build God's kingdom and seeing more people become the hands and the feet of Jesus.